Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar series of Mastering SQL Server Migrations uh, uh, by SQL Governor. And today we are talking about the selecting migration tools. And here with me are uh, Matt, Rob. Hello. <laughs> and also soon Gianluca, unfortunately, uh, he's a bit late, but he's going to uh, be just in a second right there or <coughs> any, anywhere. But uh, we, we will start anyway the uh, webinar now. And uh, um, so first of all, welcome everybody. And uh, this is the agenda, what, what we are going to do. So first I will introduce panelists a bit bit more in detail. Then we go to panel discussion for about 40 minutes, Q&A time for any questions, answers there, 10 minutes, and then summary five minutes in, in the end of the webinar. And so uh, Matt, please tell something about yourself with a few words. Uh, with a few words, I I didn't have a beard when this picture was taken, but you know, thanks to not having gone anywhere in months, now I do. Uh, Rob has always had his, but yeah. So yeah, I've I've been involved in community stuff for several years, and as the years go on, more and more. Um, and I've done a lot of migrations the last two or three years, and I'm actually prepping another large one right now. So this is always fun to talk about uh, and I usually learn something that helps me too which is nice all right thank you Matt and then Rob hi I'm Rob uh, yeah my beard's a little bit longer than it was in that photo because you know we're in lockdown um, I, I'm uh, yeah dual MVP um, I'm a consultant do uh, a lot of automation work um, including migrations obviously um and right now i'm doing a project to migrate to manage instance so all is good hello thank you rob and then uh i will introduce Gianluca. so Gianluca sartori uh he's uh uh, uh developer slash dba from uh uh italy and works in his company sqlconsulting.it and has been working with uh, SQL Server since version 7, so quite a long time. And uh, Gianluca also is specialized in the SQL Server, SQL Server uh, migrations. And uh, Gianluca is going to attend this webinar pretty soon as well. So, so uh, that's, that's about Gianluca. And then uh, a couple of words from myself. So my name is Jani Savolainen, and I'm founder and CDO of SQL Governor and DP Pro Services. SQL Governor is a performance management and capacity planning software company uh, located in Finland, and, and DP Pro Services is a, a, a data platform services company uh, located in, in Finland. And I'm pretty much jack of all trades, king of none. So I have done everything from a database uh, query optimization to a data science, so everything in between. And a lot of uh, uh, data warehousing and also especially uh, capacity planning projects, like tens of capacity planning projects, what comes to uh, migrations of SQL servers. All right, let's start. So um, today, we are going to uh, discuss on selecting the migration tools. So last time we talked about business impact review, and before that we had the general discussion of pretty much everything. Uh, and if you haven't seen those webinars, you can see them, uh, for example, on from our uh, website, sqlgovernor.com. So you're able to see them there as well. And we are going to have still a few webinars after after this one. So um, this is today's agenda here. OK, and what we are going to discuss. So um, first of all, we are going to cover the uh, things like uh, the budget that is very uh, 
essential what comes to uh, selecting different migration tools and and those tools can really affect big time on your uh, budget actually uh, higher all over <laughs> then the scheduling uh, in which phase e each of the steps should be initiated and so forth and then um, about on-premises versus cloud or hybrid anything in between what comes to uh, migration tools and and so forth then also, uh, what are the different migration tools? What comes to discovery, monitoring, capacity planning, and also the uh, migration implementation? And in the end, we discuss a little bit about the integratability of, of these tools. All right. So the first thing that we are going to discuss here is the budget. So every IT project starts with a certain budget. And um, it's, it's great if the budget is exactly met, but quite often there is uh, like uh, some volatility on, on, on that. And what are the factors that uh, uh, affect the budget and so forth? So Matt, would you please tell us everything we should know about the uh, migration project budget on, on, on selecting the tools and how they affect the whole 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 thing well i can't promise everything but i can tell you some things that i've learned um the number one thing is going to seem obvious but i've seen it happen over and over again i may or may not have done it in the past so i feel like it's a good thing to start with and what you shouldn't imagine here is a don't imagine the happy path is what's actually going to happen because what i have seen especially in larger projects where you're trying to shut a data center down or half of one or a few racks or something like that what happens is you say okay we're going to be ready we're going to go live in in the cloud on day x and after that day we will have no on-prem uh costs at all everything will magically work even if everything does magically work what my experience has been is again especially in, in larger shops something gets hung up either somebody's like oh no we have an end of month process and you can't do that the time you were scheduled it needs to wait two weeks you'd like to say they're going to tell you that months in advance they're not probably um, so build in a little slack and if you do that it's easier to explain say listen we need to build in costs that we may or may not spend because let's imagine we're going to be running both places. Um, if you don't build in that slack, then the conversation gets really uncomfortable. Because again, especially a larger shop, data center costs are significant. And if you end up saying like, yeah, we're going to be there another month with, with this app or something like that, um, that conversation can be difficult sometimes because it can be a, a fair amount of money. So that's kind of the most obvious thing. And it sounds like a silly mistake, but it's an easy thing to forget because in our mind, we're saying like, all right, this is gonna be done this day. And, um, and you know, after this day, everything's great. Um, kind of the next mistake that I've seen, it's pretty easy to make is, especially if, if the DBA is, is or, or the DBA lead is kind of head of, of cost management for this and things like that, you know, when they say, you know, data center, why? We want to move it to the cloud. What do we do? And how much will it cost? Well, that person is going to head to the pricing calculator for, for whatever their cloud of choice is. And they're going to say, I need this many of this server and this many of this service and all that. And it costs X. Um, what is easy to forget is the network infrastructure in, in the cloud, Azure, Amazon, whatever, goes around all that and it's not free so you know i've i've, I've seen budgets turned over f from again usually the data team or the data person that includes only the data objects um and depending on you know maybe what flavor of cloud database you're running like if you're running mi you're probably going to have you potentially may have a more complicated network infrastructure around it than some other ones and you know cost comes with all of that um so so don't forget your network objects when you price out all of your data stuff um and like i said just it's 
just build a little slack in with the realization that that cutover may not happen completely on that day uh, that you think it will. I, Rob is raising his hand. I don't think he's yeah, waving exactly. at me. So go no, ahead. I, was, <laughs> I did want to say that, um, especially as you, you mentioned managed instance and, and networking objects, is sometimes your team is not in charge of those, including in charge of the budget or the people that need to make the change. So you've got to remember when you're budgeting that sometimes that team includes people, you know, maybe third parties, maybe uh, sort of slightly coupled providers that are that are doing work for you, and and that's part of the budget too. That's a great point because it actually harkens back to something I think we talked about last time, uh, or maybe the time before then, was that even even though the data team may lead the project and we may have ultimate responsibility for it because it's our data that's moving you generally have to get other teams along for the ride and like you said budget's no different there at all you're you're going to need their help with setup and, and things like that probably anyway um, and so yeah not only do you need to make sure you've accounted for the budget but a company of almost any size that's probably a different cost center might be a different set of approvals so you may have all your fancy Azure SQL stuff signed off on and ready to go and they're still waiting to get that signed off on. So I, I think actually that was our first session where we talked about kind of understanding the organizational structure and yeah, exactly you, you might need. Yeah. And one of the things also that affects budget and can affect budget a lot is that what kind of strategy you are going to implement against the topology of the desired target architecture. So for example, if you're going to just lift and shift, it may be fast, but you may end up having quite surprises in, in terms of budgeting because then the system is not optimized, source system is not optimized against the target and so forth. So you may want to consolidate databases, instances, servers against IAS or PaaS uh, structures. So that's also a, one thing to consider when, when thinking about budget. What's the strategy of, of moving the assets into the cloud or into a new data center? And Gianluca, hello and welcome. You're muted. Hello, everyone. Sorry. Um, apparently, time zones are hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, welcome. Yeah, uh, uh, no problem. So, um, yeah, that was good discussion about the budgets. And um, I think we can move forward if you don't have anything else to add here. OK. Let's move on. So then the scheduling. I will just say a few words about scheduling and maybe this uh, illustration that we have shown in the uh, these earlier steps is quite good to uh, kind of uh, clarify that. So first of all, when the business impact review starts and even uh, when the migration tool selection uh, starts in the very beginning of, of, of the project, the sooner the better it's quite important that the discovery is being implemented and nowadays modern discovery data discovery tools are able to do it uh, from even in big bigger environment from one day to few days to to find out to scan all the devices servers and so forth so that that is something that can be done quite fast but after that the installation of monitoring tool is super important if you don't have yet the uh, monitoring software there because uh, if you want to also understand the trends of the data what you're going to plan into the cloud or into the new uh, renewal of, of the data center you should have like a three consecutive months of data or even more to understand those behavioral characteristics of the data over time and seasonality over 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 the data so that's also something that needs to be studied in the very beginning of the project and the more you have data, the more precise answers you can give on, on, on those, on those uh, uh, projects. Of course, another way is if you're using workload type, type of, of uh, um, capacity planning tools, for example, then you can start the, um, uh, for example, the measuring the data in, in, in the peak season or so forth. So it's, it's, it's even like a faster process. But that we will discuss later on with with Chang Luka, definitely. Uh, uh, and then um, what else? Then there is typically a, a few planning meetings against the capacity planning, and 
you should take some time for them if there is just like a few servers or a few tens of servers it's quite fast it's like a two workshops and 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 it's 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 done but then when you're having 100 or more work uh, those servers source servers you are going to uh, migrate into a into a new environment you should uh, take more time to have those workshops on 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 how the uh, external dependencies are affected and for example what's the desired target architecture what's the actual environment and what are the options to uh, target the topology against the in environment and what's the strategy as, as discussed in the budget phase uh, that what you want to uh, select to uh, transfer those workloads is it the hybrid or just the lift and shift and so forth or is it the consolidation or something else and then there is uh, uh, capacity planning that typically takes just a few hours if, if you have a few servers or 10 servers and if you have like a tens of servers it takes a may take even like a couple of days and then if you have a hundred or more servers it will definitely take several days then to uh, uh, make a proper capacity planning of, of, of your system depending with which tools you are using but if you are not using any tools then it will definitely take more than just a few days for example for 100 plus servers it, it will take like uh, weeks or months so um, and then uh, after that there is this detailed specification and migration implementation and detail specification can be started when you know the topology and you know the targets where you're going to uh, go to and so forth so that's pretty much straightforward that that can happen from few days to uh, even like uh, months if the environment is very big and and then the migration implementation i think it's better to uh, uh, hear the specialist on this area now so for example uh, would you like to say, uh, for example, Rob, something about the uh, typical length of the migration implementation on, on different scales of the different scale of, of the environment, uh, how, how big they are? It's really hard to say, isn't it? Because the the size of the environment is going to be a big um, part of this it might be um, always you want to make the, the the time that you're that you're doing this very very slow but the um if you have a lot of data to move it's going to take you a lot of time and then you might need to think about how you're going to um, ensure that your cutover time is much smaller and equally you're never just moving your production databases you you've always got other environments um, involved as well and the, the they can quite often be moved during the day you can get an agreement with you know the dev teams that they don't do anything for these these days and you can move things through so um, it's it you, you need to think about it as we we keep saying all the way through this there's, there's an idea of a framework that you can use but each time you're going to come you're going to make different choices as to where you're going to end up Matt, you, did you have something to say there? No? Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. For example, if you have like a, sometimes when there is a very, uh, um, very, if it's very well planned environment that you know exactly what's the sources and targets. And if you have the ideal environment that you have very fast, uh, fast and relatively small workloads to transfer and so forth, it can be just like a, happen like this so I have seen the project where it's 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 done within a few hours of a day or something like that but sometimes it can take like uh, months to uh, and even more to a kind of uh, if there is very big environment to uh, to be able to map all those uh, uh, parts of the uh, source environment to target so it really depends and and that's hard to that's why I asked you <laughs> My dear colleagues, that the, uh, do you have any understanding what would be like an average on on any scale? But that's hard to say. I would say. It, var it varies so much with with each project you do. To be honest. Yeah. 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 Okay, so well, you, you can. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it, and it's also, you know, it comes back to even though we may want to just stay in one place and do our data things, sometimes we have to understand, you know, the business 
needs behind whatever we're moving and all that, what the impacts would be. And, and I know that that's something that we've talked about as well, but that can impact all of that because the best technical solution may not be the best solution for the business. And yeah, we, we have to be flexible there as well. Yeah, exactly. So, so this is the part where you can, it, it's kind of like, how would I say, um, um, the most misty area of the uh, migration. So it can, it can really uh, kind of uh, lengthen the whole project uh, scope and time. So, so that's good to know. There can be surprises, but that's important that when you're doing the risk analysis in the technical planning meetings, you go through these things and what would be the risks, what would be the kind of the potential problem areas in, in the migration implementation. So then you have an early idea of, of, of the uh, kind of the speed of the migration process so you are not going to make a, two optimal estimates on on when the project will be ready okay so uh, let's go to next topic and that will be uh, on premises versus cloud and Gianluca please uh, would you like to say something about this well, I think the, the main takeaway for this topic is that you have to choose the tools you will use for the migration, uh, keeping in mind what's your source and target environment. So basically, uh, if you are moving from on-prem to a specific uh, cloud provider, you will have to keep in mind that not all the tools that you use on-premises will work in the cloud and you have some restrictions on which tools will work on any of these environments so that's very important to go and look up what are the tools available from the cloud providers and uh, which are the limitations regarding the on-prem tools that you probably already know and you use every day in your on-prem environment and some of those will probably stop working when you are moving to the cloud. And other things to keep in mind is uh, if you have some hybrid environment, uh, you will probably need to uh, lower uh, the bar and use uh, the common uh, ground of tools that work in both environments or maybe leverage the capabilities or of some of the tools only in the place when they work. And things get even more complicated if you are working with a multi-cloud environment. Uh, well, uh, in those cases, you will have tools for uh, different, uh, from different cloud providers, and some of those will not work in other uh, providers' environments. So uh, it's uh, super important that, that at this stage you, you choose uh, whatever um, does the job, uh, keep in mind what are the limitations and uh, capabilities in different environments. Yeah, exactly. Um, Rob, Matt, do you have anything to add here? Okay. Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> very well yeah it, it it's it's a topic that would be like a easily to be worth discussing of one hour or so but it it, it would be maybe a even a different topic topic of a, a webinar of its own so uh, yeah. let's go, yeah let's go to next thing then so um then the discovery tools who would like to tell about this I can start the chat and then point three, I will likely hand it off to one of the people on either side of me because they know a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, so one thing that's important uh, and is knowing what you have and what you're trying to move. Um, I know if, if you've never, if you're sitting out there and you've never worked on a large project that that seems mind blowing. Because you're just like, well, no, they tell you you move this many servers and they're called this and we decide what we're going to move them to and, and we move them. But especially in, you know, kind of mid-size to large size environments, there are an amazing number of SQL server boxes that somehow 
create themselves. Um, we know that doesn't happen, but stuff appears. And then you're like, well, what is this server? Oh yeah, well, we use that to support this one function of this other app. And it's like, well, where is that? Is it in the data center with all the other ones for that app? Oh no, it's not. This one person set it up and it's in their supply closet or it's under their desk or, you know, that it seems like an exaggeration, but it really isn't. So you need some tools that help you discover what the environment is because every migration project of any decent size that I've been involved in, you end up running one of these tools and then asking, well, what is this and what is this and what does this do? And we've always saved ourselves some hardship down the road by doing that. So I almost think it's useful even if, you know, unless it is a specific list and they're like, this is all we have. And if it doesn't move, we don't care because it's not important. Um, if it's one, if you're getting, you know, if, if the statement of work or what you've been assigned to do or how, it, whatever approach you're taking there, if it's move the things that support these apps, then a discovery tool is really important. Um, better to ask questions that people think are kind of dumb uh, and save yourself some time than not ask them, flip the switch on all the fancy new cloud stuff and find out some server existed that also supported this that you didn't move. And then there's egg on your face for sure. So so the map toolkit, um, fairly old school, but it's a, it's a Microsoft provided tool um, that, that basically just tells you like, here's all the SQL servers I found. Here's some basic information about the version, the addition. Uh, there's some basic uh, information about the machines usually as well. It's free, uh, it's not fancy, uh, but it does do the job. Um, Movair, which is that first point there, was I think becoming kind of a migration tool of note for larger projects. Um, but Microsoft acquired them and then fairly late in the year last year uh, made you unable to acquire that yourself. So it's a software as a service thing and it used to be you could either subscribe to that or the pricing model was fairly complicated to start with, but you could be company X and go and say, I want this much of this and, you know, because I want an analysis of my environment. Um, we can't do that now. So I talk about it because you've probably heard of it. You may have used it. There are still references to it in a lot of places, but it's only available to people via the Microsoft partner program now. So if you're partnering with a consultancy um, and, and they're a Microsoft partner and you're fairly large scale, you're gonna hear them refer to this. You're, you may see this used, uh, but unfortunately we can no longer buy it ourselves. Um, and so that's, you know, the map toolkit, I would say, is almost an essential thing. Like every migration project you're doing it, you're doing, please run it. Movera, obviously not accessible to us, but if you're in a larger project, you're probably going to see it. DBA tools kind of runs the gamut. You could migrate one server, you could migrate a bunch. Uh, but the fine folks on either side of me can probably speak a little better to that functionality than I can because they might have written some of it. <laughs> Or no. know somebody that did. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the thing with discovery tools with DBA tools is um, you've got this command called find dash DBA instance. And, okay, we've got, you know, uh, there's there's discovery programs from other vendors, there's the Mappy tool, there's all these other bits and bobs. But realistically, the best people who are good at mapping out what your environment looks at looks like are the people that attack your environment. So you could go and ask the hackers, but they probably wouldn't give you everything easily. But you can go to the um, to the good guys, to the penetration testers. And there's a company called NetBite, and Scott Sutherland wrote this um, code that will go and use all of the different methods of finding your SQL servers all the way around your estate so sql servers so the servers that are hosting your sql instances well no matter what the version no matter what the addition no matter if they're a cluster no matter if they're in your active directory or not in your active directory uh if they can be communicated with then it'll do it now of course this is a penetration tool so you're going to do a lot of scanning one thing we haven't mentioned here when we're talking about discovery tools is to ensure that 
you tell the people that control your security of your estate. Because you don't want to be the guy or girl who gets the tap on the shoulder, even virtually, from the security team saying, why is this piece of software running from your laptop? So always make sure you get your thing, especially if you go start looking, you know, if you're looking at find DBA instance, um, you can very quickly set off alerts and, and there are there are comments on blog posts and on GitHub for, for people who have done that without actually getting that that check first. So yeah, DBA tools is is really awesome. Um, obviously the other way you can discover things is to see what's going on on your instance. And um, I know of beautiful Italian man who's done something that enables you to do that. Well, um, regarding the, the discovery, uh, Rob, Rob's comment is spot on. You need to go to your infrastructure team and tell them at least to uh, open the network from the machine where you ran the discovery. So uh, the, the easiest path to discovering instances, which is the SSIP protocol, is allowed from your machine to uh, the entire network and that's the easiest part uh, because it takes um, it leverages uh, the um, sequence of a browser uh, service which is in many cases disabled uh, but that's the easiest way easiest way to find a uh, sql service running in your infrastructure yeah exactly uh there is also many other tools, discovery tools, there is a plenty of them, so we didn't mention every every of them. For example, one of them to mention is like SAM360 is also a software which does the, the same thing, but the, this is very uh, important part because the bigger the environment is, if you have 100 servers, 1000 servers, you don't want to uh, make this uh, kind of mapping of the servers, all of it by hand. So it's also in, important to uh, <laughs> have have these discovery tools. And and as as Matt said, almost always the software finds out something that wasn't wasn't even like a, a, um, uh, was was not in in anybody's awareness that that those servers existed. So it's very very good way to do the um, initiate the whole whole uh, migration process. Yeah, okay. and, and one other thing that I don't, I don't want to get lost in this is, is you know, people might be sitting there and they're like, oh man, you know, I don't want to have to buy a bunch of tools though. You know, most of what we talked about is is free. Um, you can always write your own. However, there's a community that's done a bunch of this for a long time um, that you should definitely lean on. And so I think, you know, attending webinars like like this makes sense. I think this would probably be an appropriate use of, of the SQL help hashtag. Like I'm analyzing my, env my environment, I'm looking at using whatever, and you're going to get people looking at that hashtag who are going to give you well-informed answers. Um, it, it always amazes me, no matter what the topic is, even if it seems completely off the wall, how helpful people are. And I think this would be a good use of that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, let's go uh, forward then to next topic here. So uh, then uh, about monitoring tools, there is some plenty of, plenty of them because uh, as far as there has been more than one SQL Server, and even then there has been a monitoring software. So Gianluca, why don't you tell us a bit about the different monitoring tools that are available? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, as you can see, here's a short list of some of the monitoring tools available for SQL Server. Actually, there's m many more uh, that didn't fit the list, but uh, he here's the uh, most popular ones. Well, SCOM uh, comes from Microsoft, and people all often start using it because it's part of a bundle of other softwares from Microsoft. Uh, and it's pretty easy to set up and it has um, plugins for uh, SQL Server. It, actually, it's a monitoring platform for all the Microsoft uh, tools out there. 
and usually Microsoft shops um, like to use it because it's integrated with the rest. Uh, but uh, there are many other uh, monitoring solutions uh, that are general purpose, like uh, here you can see a couple like uh, Nagios. Uh, that, that one is also um, general purpose. It's not only um, SQL Server. Uh, but some other monitoring tools are specific to SQL Server, uh, like SQL Sentry. Well, actually, it's Sentry 1 now. Um, and that's one of the most popular uh, SQL Server monitoring solutions. Uh, it's a very nice uh, uh, solution, uh, very technical. It's probably uh, targeted at DBAs in, uh, especially. And others along the lines of uh, Century One are Redgate. That's also very popular, uh, especially for the um, uh, web interface, which is mm. kind of missing from other tools here in the in this list. And um, the, the GUI from Redgate is um, very uh, nicely laid out, very clear. So that's one of the. Um, uh, the, 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 the reasons why it's very popular and uh, others uh, here are based on um, uh, open source or free tools like Nagios. Um, uh, there are other solutions based on uh, um, uh, time uh, uh, databases uh, like InfluxDB. Uh, and this is like QMonitor, which is built on top of InfluxDB and Grafana. And depending on uh, uh, what's your environment, you will have to check whether uh, these uh, tools work uh, in your source and target environment. Uh, not all the tools uh, available from vendors are fully uh, compatible with all uh, cloud uh, providers, so you will have to go and check uh, whether the tools you have uh, will work or not. And if you are out in the market to get one of these tools uh, before implementing the migration, uh, that's definitely uh, one thing to check whether it will uh, fit um, uh, your target environment Be because it's not uh, completely uh, covered by all uh, the tools out there and sometimes uh, you, you have uh, surprises when moving to a new environment exactly yeah also let me mention a couple of words about our own uh, software sql governor so sql governor at the moment supports all the sql servers from 2005 version up and it's not uh, supporting the managed instances or SQL databases yet, but those functionalities are going to be there. Just want to say a few words about the SQL governor monitoring as, as well. So uh, Matt, Rob, would you like to say anything about um, other tools or should we go proceed for the next, next topic? We are a bit uh, tight on time schedule here, so so I'll say I'll say two things. Uh, number one is free open source um, SQLWatch.io. Um, super good. I've uh, literally been installing that recently. I've done some work on that one. And uh, more corporate uh, end is you can also use Azure Arc. So it's the new offering from Azure enabling you to pull your on-premises um, servers into a, a one-piece Azure offering. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, let's move forward then. Um, okay, then about capacity planning tools. So let me take this one. Uh, so um, first of all, Movere is very uh, versatile tool for uh, especially the bigger environments. If you have like a thousand database servers or more, that would be like a most most uh, relevant option. Uh, not only because the Movere itself, it handles the discovery part, the monitoring part, so taking the uh, kind of resource consumption, workload consumption data, and also the capacity planning part. 
So in that way, in that sense, it's like a, a versatile uh, tool to just like a kind of a, if 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 you're able to select that software, so you can get get all all that stuff. And then there is um, two different kinds of capacity planning tools in addition to Mover. That is a SQL governor. That is our software, and then the workload tools that actually John Luca can uh, tell a bit more about. What is the difference in between the monitoring-based capacity planning tools and then actually workload-based uh, capacity planning tools? That's very interesting, and that would be a, a webinar of its own of the differences of those software. Because typically, when you have very, very business-critical servers, and it's extremely um, important that you understand that what would be the capacity exactly on certain um, what if scenario that that you're running for example if you're running on your peak day there how it would look like in the for example azure managed instance business critical this and this or uh ias uh, vm on on aws or something like that so would you would like to uh, uh then uh, record this workload and and replay that on on that target server and get exact statistics out of that and John Luca can tell of course more about it but then there is a different way to do the capacity planning as well that's based on monitoring and long-term monitoring of continuous data when you get the long-term monitoring of continuous data capacity planning data you you are not able to just um, not only to uh, make the understanding of uh, the seasonal characteristics over time but also able to calculate the trend so if you want to understand what's your workload after one year, three years, five years, you, you get pretty decent, good understanding of, of this. And this is what SQL Governor is actually doing. So it takes the long-term trends and analyzes the hour series of the workloads aggregated from the smaller uh, uh, time, time spans there inside the, within the uh, capacity planning and is able to do this, uh, this uh, very specific analysis and not only doing the capacity planning but also the automated consolidation whether you have the servers or you have the instances or if you have the databases you can automate and 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 help these processes to make most balanced uh target platform there so so that's one of the benefits of, of sql Gunner. but please john luca tell about tell us about workload tools a bit well, Workload Tools is a collection of command line tools that you can uh, use to uh, capture, analyze, or replay a workload from a SQL Server um, instance to another SQL Server instance. And that helps you um, figure out what would happen if you migrated to a different environment, which is exactly what we are discussing. So uh, you can have your workload tools capturing your workload over an extended period of time and then have uh, this uh, workload replayed against a target SQL server either at a second, uh, at a later moment or in real time. And then you can compare uh, what's the performance in the source and target environment. And this can give you an idea of the performance you will be getting in the target environment and this can help you um, decide whether it's worth uh, bumping some resources or uh, keeping it the way it is because you know in the cloud you just have to move some knobs and uh, when those knobs move it's money that goes out of your pocket Exactly. So maybe to sum it up, what's the difference in between, for example, uh, workloads like uh, SQL Governor and, and workload tools is like uh, SQL Governor fits better into like if you have tens to hundreds of servers and workload tools is maybe better to have those most important servers or like a few servers to a few tens of servers when you're going to do the capacity planning. Am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's yeah. It's impossible to use workload tools to test uh, uh, hundreds of servers uh, one by one, but it's definitely worth uh, having a spin uh, with workload tools uh, when you have a very problematic instance and you want to know exactly how it will perform in the target environment. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, what you see is what you get there. 
So, so that's yeah. that's of course also the capacity planning, monitoring based capacity planning tools when the algorithms are very well well put. So, also what I can say from from my uh, perspective, uh, we have found out that it's it's actually very accurate. It's not super accurate like when you do the work workload comparison, but it's very accurate. The margin is like a five percent or something. So it's it's really really accurate there. So uh, then about the migration implementation tools, and uh, I think Rob, you are the one to tell about this. Um, yeah. So uh, if we're migrating, then um, DBA tools is a fantastic. Um, tool set to use. If you're looking at migrating many instances or you're looking at migrating one large instance, you can do it with DBA tools. You will want to write your code in different ways. DBA tools, it, one of the selling points is you can migrate an instance with just a single line of code. It's great for demos. I love doing it because it just makes people's heads explode that you can do all of this. But when it comes to real life, you know, you, you're going to want to separate these things out and do it that way. Um, Azure uh, have a data migration service, which enable you to migrate your databases from your on-premises into the Azure data platform, um, it, very much within the portal. There, there is some automation around there, but it, it's a very, very nice, useful. AWS I haven't used. Um, but uh, Management Studio, of course, you can back up and restore databases from Management Studio. You can create backpacks, data tier applications, and then upload them into Azure for Azure SQL Database. You probably only want to do that if you've got something you really need to handhold that's just a one-off. Probably the other three are going to be the ones you're going to use most of all. Yeah. Matt, have you used AWS? Uh, very, very lightly. The experience is pretty similar to Azure. Um, I, you know, I feel like both companies are putting a lot of time and effort there because the previous migration tooling experience is, uh, is not optimal, uh, but it's certainly getting better. And yeah, Management Studio, um, there is, it's a demo that I show in a session that I give, and you're right, you can't scale it. But you can actually, if you have an Azure SQL database set up, you can right click on a database and it's it's not exactly migrate to azure but it basically says that and it's a wizard and you walk through it and it works and it's fun to demo because honestly when i was putting the session together is when i learned about it i everything you just said i i knew about but i didn't know there there was a wizard for it but the later versions have it and you know, I, I kind of joke in there, like if you're in a pinch and your boss is like, you're going to get your bonus this quarter if you migrate a database to Azure. Go to Management Studio, right click on it, do that. And then yeah. money rolls in, right? Uh, but yeah, you can't scale that. It's it's better for demos and one-offs than anything you else. You probably don't want to do that with a one terabyte database. No. Yeah, I suspect <laughs> it has scale issues that way too. You're exactly right. <laughs> um, so the, the issue is actually with the backpack. So a backpack um, starts to behave interestingly above about 200 gigabytes. But that also just reminded me that um, Jess Schultz um, created um, a way to automate many of those things. Um, she has a Docker container, which you, and, and all the code to put it up into Azure, which will take a, um, a backpack, sorry, a backup, um, or an MDF file that gets dropped into a file share, spin up a container, load the database, create a backpack, and then drop that off into somewhere else. So you, the, there is some some automation coming through in those in those fields. I, I love I love that project. It's absolutely okay. Uh, I, very good discussion here. Uh, and then uh, integratability of, of tools. Uh, let me say just a couple of word of words of this. As, as said, uh, Movera is one of the tools that is like a Swiss knife in a way that it has the discovery, it has the monitoring, it has the capacity planning itself. But also uh, some other tools are, are also having like, uh, uh, for example, integratability from discovery part to monitoring, from monitoring to capacity planning and so forth. So you, for example, um, 
I must say uh, here, as John Luca referred here, for example, the SQL Sentry, Sentry One SQL Sentry uh, monitoring software, that is very good monitoring software. Actually, SQL Governor has implemented an API to SQL Sentry. So you're able, if you're using the SQL Sentry and you have it already in your environment, if you have uh, months of data there or even years of data or so forth, so you just uh, um, uh, apply the uh, uh, SQL Governor there and it uh, sucks out the data from the Sentry One SQL Sentry repository, and then you're able to do the capacity planning immediately without any uh, kind of uh, delays to uh, to uh, this capacity planning. So this is one of the examples that there exists this kind of uh, uh, integrations in in between the um, software as as well. So um, uh, does anybody else want to add on something on integratability before we have a time to a few minutes for the questions? Okay, very good. So now please, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. We have uh, like uh, six minutes of time here still to uh, answer your questions. We may have stunned them into silence. Yeah, just a second. I, I tried to see. I think there is something here in the... Um, questions. <laughs> Am I messing up here or something? I don't see questions yet. Um, Oh, there. Okay. Um, yeah, I can see the pane, but it's empty. Um, but there are yeah, apparently yeah. some there, according to the chat, which is confusing. <laughs> okay, now I now I have here something. Let me see. Quite many, actually. Um, Um, okay, um, let me see. Uh, there is one question about the Azure Synapse Analytics uh, and better cybersecurity and machine learning uh, and opinion on the server time cost on VM machine. Does anybody have on that area any, any, any knowledge? what comes to uh, Synapse Analytics. Quite new things, so... Uh... Yeah, it sounds like it's specific to a VM as well. So, yeah, I'm not I'm not entirely sure what's what's being asked there, if I'm being honest. Then send, a, send an email in to, to Matt, yeah. and um, if he can help, I'm okay. sure he'll be able to. Yeah. We find out. Yeah. So... Um, Synapse next, can um, migrate it on itself, and that's it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, okay. Very well. Um, I think that the, this is pretty much what is, is around this. Um, well, this on on this topic that is most relevant. There are some other questions, but maybe we need to uh, answer them and and gather gather the results. It's it's a bit bit um, like not not exactly to the maybe this area. So, but we can of course still answer the questions. Yeah, if we can, and I, I'm sure there's a way to do this. Just pull all those out and put them in an email. We can sort them out from there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good. But yeah, I think that uh, you were saying something. No, I was just okay. going to say send all the synapse ones to Rob. <laughs> yeah, very good. So um, <laughs> the next uh, webinar topic then, it's about capacity planning and licensing review. That's super important. Every topic that we are discussing here in the webinar series are important, but 
especially the capacity planning and licensing review, because that's the biggest individual thing that affects your budget, I would say. So uh, we are going to have that later on, um, most likely in February. So, so that is going to be, be then an uh, in interesting discussion. And uh, you can also follow us on Twitter. So there is Matt SQL at Speed, John Luca, uh, Spaghetti DBA, Rob SQL DBA with the bird, obviously, <laughs> and then myself, the Cypher Sigma. And thank you very much uh, to participating in this. And hope, hopefully, you got some new ideas and, and things to uh, think about. And let's uh, uh, meet again then within a month or so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Stay safe.